thank you once again for um, taking the time to participate in this live webinar. We really appreciate your time and hopefully we'll, we'll be sharing a lot of very useful information with all of you. Um, today's webinar is part of a series of webinars that are uh, part of our Food Safety for Farmers uh, project. Uh, and today we will be talking to uh, a few folks who have a lot of experience in uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act regulations, uh, and we're really, really delighted to have them with us today. So with that, I would like to uh, go over a few things before we get started. Um, first, you know, want to thank uh, our panelists, Billy Mitchell, uh, Farm Manager of the Working Farms Fund, Dr. Chris Gunter, Professor and Chair at the University of Florida's Horticultural Sciences Department, and Trevor Gilbert, produce safety expert uh, in the US Food and Drug Administration Center Food for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. I'm Juan Carlos Rodriguez. I am a education and outreach specialist with Florida Organic Growers, and I will be your moderator, and I'll do my best to try to moderate today's uh, webinar uh, and allow uh, for uh, opportunities at the end for any of your questions. We would like to thank the uh, USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture's Food Safety Outreach Program for funding our project and making it possible for us to provide all of you with information regarding the Food Safety Modernization Act regulations through our podcast and webinars. Um, although our intent is not to provide legal advice through these webinars and podcasts, uh, we hope that the information and content that we will be discussing today, which is based on our experiences and opinions, will be useful to all of you. Um, if you have any specific questions or that you would like to find out more about FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, we um, <clears throat> suggest that you check out their website where you will um, you know, find a lot of useful information and we will also be providing that website to you at the end of this webinar. I would like to sort of just take a minute to let you know what we hope to be discussing in today's webinar. We will be finding out a little bit more about who our panelists are, but we also want to uh, remind you that we do have uh, other podcasts uh, where we've been discussing food safety topics, including podcast episode four, in which we also discuss some of the lessons that we have learned from farmers. We will hopefully be able to address some of the questions that uh, we often get from farmers and, as I indicated, provide an opportunity to all of you who have joined to ask your own questions, which again, I welcome everybody to write in the chat so we can get to them at the end of this webinar. And with that, I would like to provide uh, an opportunity to our panelists to introduce themselves and uh, tell us a little bit about their background. Um, so everyone who is uh, joining us today can get to know you better. Billy, would you like to start? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks, JC. Uh, hey, y'all. Um, my name is Billy Mitchell, coming to you from the University of Georgia Science Library in Athens, Georgia. I've had um, just a great experience with food safety and farming, the opportunity to work on a bunch of different small-scale diversified vegetable farms, manage a four-and-a-half-acre farm that used to be right in downtown Atlanta next to the King Center, and over the past four years, been doing produce safety outreach and education as part of a FDA funded project called the Local Food Safety Collaborative. And recently moved over to a new role with the Conservation Fund, working with small scale farms that are scaling up and starting to access mid sized marketplaces and just increase the size and operations of their farms. And I think just like Trevor and Chris, you know, I do a lot of produce safety education with farmers and that's a two-way street. We're certainly sharing what we know, but we're in a really great place to also learn so much from the farmers that we work with. Uh, I would say that they are the definitely the produce safety experts. I'm very much a produce safety enthusiast. 
and I'm excited to be on this webinar today. Thank you, Billy. Trevor? Yes, thank you and uh, good afternoon, hi everyone. Uh, Trevor Gilbert with the FDA. Um, I just echoed Billy's uh, last statement about us, you know, sharing produce safety rule education with you and also learning from you as well, but more a little bit about myself. I do have an extension background, serve um, in the Eastern Caribbean doing agricultural extension for about 11 years. Then I actually work with the USDA AMS. So I have a very strong audit background as well you know, mostly with the terminal market inspections. And now with the FDA on the um, produce safety rule, you know, um, technical assistance, that's that's what we call ourselves the PSN. So we provide, you know, technical assistance training, you know, just helping, you know, you stakeholders to, you know, have a better understanding of the produce safety rule, you know, be a resource to you as well for questions that you may have. You know, we may not have all the answers, but we sure can work the process to getting you the answers, so to speak. And also, um, you know, it's just another wonderful opportunity for the FDA to, to build on the relationships we have with FOG. Um, again, you know, very grateful to this organization for engaging us and giving us the opportunity to, you know, have this direct line of communication with you. And um, we have partnered on many activities in the past, and um, we surely um, will look forward to continued uh, collaborations in this regard. So without much ado, um, Happy to be a resource and to answer. Thank you, Trevor. Um, Dr. Gunter? Sure. I'm, I'm Chris Gunter, and I am uh, currently now the chair of the Horticultural Science Department at, at the University of Florida. Um, in my previous role, I was a vegetable production specialist with North Carolina State University. Um, so I spent several years working directly with farmers on Food, food safety related issues um, and helping them really to understand how food safety practices impact the, the safety of their produce and how they can um, implement the FISMA produce safety rule on their farms um, and work together with them to develop, you know, good agricultural practices really for the farming operations that they have. So in working with several sizes of farms, many, many farmers, um, from small to, to large wholesale operations to, to sort of understand better the implementation of food safety on their farms. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I've been in Florida for about a year now and really, um, really happy to interact with the Florida Organic and also to learn about your farms and what you're, what you're experiencing here with regard to production and also food safety. Thank you to everyone uh, uh, of our panelists for, again, joining us today and providing us with the knowledge and experience that they have. Um, I want to take an opportunity to uh, remind people about our podcast that is available on our website and where we have published already um, episodes on different food safety topics. Podcast episode four, which is the most recent episode, we discuss once again, you know, those lessons that through FISMA and those people involved, uh, we have learned from farmers. In today's food climate and environment, um, buyers and consumers obviously want to know that the food that they buy are safe to eat uh, and that they can trust farmers are taking reasonable steps to produce these foods. Uh, and we know that farmers, all of those, all of those uh, who are joining us today, are being very thoughtful and they're doing their best to make sure that they're producing food that is safe. Uh, good agricultural practices uh, developed by the produce industry, the FDA and the USDA are voluntary guidelines uh, on practices that can help minimize the risk of microbial contamination in produce. One of the things that we discussed during that episode was whether or not food safety certification um, is voluntary. And the answer to that question is yes, it is voluntary. Uh, farmers have a choice to decide when and how to adopt good agricultural practices. If they do this and it becomes mandatory at some point on a federal or state level, um, obviously those farmers uh, will be ahead of the game. Uh, another 
topic or another question that we often um, see is is why uh, if you know small farms that are certified orga organic need to get food safety certification. Um, but we know uh, those of uh, that are uh, certified organic farmers uh, in today's uh, webinar, organic certification is separate from food safety certification. Uh, we know that harmful microbial contamination can occur uh, on organic produce, just as it does on um, non-organic and conventional fruits and vegetables. And it can also happen in small farms and large farms. Uh, farmers who adopt good agricultural practices or gaps as they are often called, uh, will minimize the potential risk from microbial pathogens. Um, additionally, some buyers might ask farmers to do a food safety audit if they want to sort of, you know, buy from them. Or these buyers feel better about doing business when they know that farmers have had um, these food safety audits. Um, and one other question or topic that we discussed in episode four was how long it takes to prepare a farm for an audit and what is the general cost? Uh, and the answer to that question, as it often is, is it depends. And it depends on the extent of the food safety practices needed to comply and the grower's motivation. The best way to prepare is to download the audit and see what you need to prepare. We'll be talking a little bit about that today. And most people who have never been audited might want you know, three to six months to prepare for this particular audit. The prices vary depending on the amount of time the um, inspector or the auditor is gonna spend at the farm uh, and the distance that they need to travel. Uh, we know that the cost can be anywhere between 600 to $1,200, and sometimes it can be a little bit more. Um, but it is a good idea to, you know, call around, uh, talk to those certifiers that can provide, you know, these food safety audits so you can get the best and most accurate estimate. At this point, I'd like to open it up to our panelists to see if they have any comments um, or things that they would like to share with uh, all of you regarding these four key points um, that, as I said, we'll discuss in our episode four. Yeah, thanks, thanks, JC. I guess just a, a couple of things to add and to echo. You know, we part of the reason it's become more common is that the general public is more aware of outbreaks, and like you said, it's just one additional way to gain the trust of buyers. And while certainly the certification is voluntary, you know, I'd say that what we see on small farms is that they're often already following these practices out of community care, that they know their customers and they want to do everything they can to take care of the people that they're feeding and they're serving. Um, and then a big motivator to get these certifications, like the GAF audit ones, really is the buyer. Oftentimes it's just, it's a buyer request, but we do see some small farms go through it because they just want to see where they're at. They want to benchmark themselves against that audit. Like you said, you can download it. You can do a self audit. And then I, I will stick with the, it's complicated and it depends for how long it takes to prepare. But the best thing you can do now is really download that audit. And I think really be pleasantly surprised that you might not be doing all the paperwork required, but you probably are following a significant amount of the practices. I think you're muted, Trevor, but I would like to ask you if uh, you had anything else to add to what Billy just said. Yes, thanks. Um, yes, I was muted, sorry about that. So it's just another way um, for FDA, uh, from the FDA side, um, to show the advancement in preventive um, food safety practices, you know, that is being demonstrated by farms as they participate in these um, programs, you know, um, for the, from the produce safety rule perspective, even that is a regulatory inspection, it still again is demonstrating the compliance to the um, produce safety rule, and you know it's just another method of you know just gaining the consumer confidence that you know you know these minimum food safety practices are in place, and then you know the farms are. Uh, adhering them and applying them. So I, I think they all complement each other and it's, it's a step in the right direction. Great. 
Um, Dr. Gunther? Yeah, I'll agree with, with both um, Billy and Trevor. I think uh, it's important to remember that good agricultural practices certifications are voluntary, uh, but FISMA, uh, as Trevor mentioned, is, is not a voluntary um, program. That's a, that's a requirement for, for farms and, and many small farms are likely to be exempt from the rule, but, but until you know uh, what that rule entails or what food safety practices are required, you just don't know. So fi finding out about that, as Billy suggested, just downloading that information and starting to familiarize yourself with food safety um, practices and operations is really critical. Um, the other thing I'll say is, you know, a lot of times small farms feel like uh, small farmers feel like this is a barrier. There's a barrier to food safety because oftentimes there's an expense to changing practices. But as, as Billy mentioned, you're probably already doing a lot of these practices on the farm. You just, you just haven't realized that they were um, also part of your good agricultural practice certification. It's, it's already a process that you're doing. Um, the implementation of that on the farm is probably already being done, but but the record keeping part you might not be doing yet. And that's a piece that takes time and oftentimes, um, you know, when you're hot in the farming operation, we don't take enough time to, to document what we do. And so sometimes that takes a little bit of time to, to implement. But, but I, I do think that getting ready for food safety on the farm, most of the small farms we've been on, um, they already have that as a core value for the for the business for the farm and so um, documenting what you do to, to show others that you're already doing it is often just a small step um, in in regards to the rest of the processes you're already doing so um, finding out about that's really critical yeah thank you um so <clears throat> we keep hearing um the term good agricultural practices, which I'm sure many farmers are familiar with. But also um, one of the things that we often get asked is what is the difference between an on-farm readiness uh, review or audit and good agricultural practices? Because these are terms that, you know, um, in the food safety world um, are often discussed. Would you guys mind, mind you discussing a little bit about what the difference between uh, these two terms are? Yeah, thanks, JC. I'll, I'll point out a big key difference, and then I'll let um, Trevor dive a little deeper in on-farm readiness reviews and Chris a little deeper in the gap audits. But the big key difference usually is that going through a good agricultural practice audit is usually going to cost you some money. Every once in a while, a buyer is paying for it or a service provider, but oftentimes there is a financial transaction involved and you are going to learn something on that audit every time. Whereas the on-farm readiness review, there is no monetary cost. There still is time that you're giving up, but it's also really an, an educational opportunity for you to see where you're at and learn more about the produce safety rule. I, I hope that's uh, in line with what you're going to share, Trevor, and I'll pass the mic over to you for more about on-farm readiness reviews. Thank you, Billy, for making that distinction because I've spent a good deal of my career doing gap audits while at USDA, so I will speak to uh, <laughs> to on-farm readiness review. Um, I would say upfront, if you have not participated in an on-farm readiness review for whatever reason, I'm hopefully can give you all the reasons why you should consider very strongly um, from today. Reason being, this is one of the tools that was developed by mostly by NASDA, um, of course, in collaboration with FDA, as a, tool, as a resource to help farmers better understand the requirements of the produce safety rule. So, and, and if you are, say, for example, um, are subject to the produce safety rule, the on farm readiness review helps with, you know, understanding of how the, the regulators would approach the farm, how they will conduct the inspections on the farm and getting more precise, it's voluntary. So it's a non-regulatory um, visit to your farm, uh, unpacking house. And the goal really is to observe like the current practices on your farm, unpacking house, and provide feedback, you know, live feedback on how those practices can be strengthened 
to better align with the regulatory expectations, you know, when you are to get a, a, an inspection of, of the, from the regulators. So the reviews are not, they are not inspections. We want to make that clear. And um, they are mostly conducted by your state partners. So one of the first things we would encourage is to reach out to your State Department of Ag. You know, the FDA has cooperative agreements with the states and others uh, to conduct these on-farm readiness reviews. And they are strictly educational. Um, us with the PSN, sometimes we do um, join our state partners just as observers and, and also for us to learn and understand their practices as well, you know, as they lead the on-farm readiness reviews. There will be no note taken or anything of that nature. If any written stuff um, is, is, is done during the on-farm risk review, all of that information will be left with you, the farmer. So it's something that helps you to prepare for the event of an inspection. So I would advise you to you know, reach out to your state counterparts you know, to see how that program is offered in your state or, and uh, how you can participate because it's, it's really a great resource you know, overall. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add, you know, uh, gap audit is designed to to look at a specific farm area farming operation and and tell you whether you have um, completed the requirements for those sections of that certification in order to earn a certification. Um, the on farm readiness review really is designed to be a comprehensive look at your farming operations, all of your farming operations, in order to see how the FSMA produce safety rule uh, overlays itself onto your current practices. So just to give you a, a, a brief example, if you were to get a good agricultural practice audit for a farm field that you were growing tomatoes in, for example, the scope of the gap audit would be limited to that operation in the in that field setting and would be only covering that crop which you're trying to get certified um, but the on-farm readiness review really is designed to be a comprehensive look at all of your farming operations so that you can really see where does where do food safety risks enter my farming operation and am i aware of those and can I do something about it um, to reduce the risk uh, for the produce that I'm growing? The, the challenge though is FSMA is not voluntary, right? So you, you are going to eventually have some, a regulatory person come to the farm and look at your farming operation and see if you are or are not in compliance with the rule. But a gap audit is completely voluntary. You ask those folks to come to your farm and rate your farming um, processes in this for this certification. You're trying to earn that certification, right? Um, so when the gap auditor is on the farm, if there are things in that audit that you decide you're not going to be able to comply with, you just lose those points on that gap audit. You pass or fail based on a points system. But the on-farm readiness review really isn't structured that way. It's a much more open-ended um, probing questions to find out what you're doing on the farm and how those farming operations may uh, impact the safety of the produce that you're, that you're producing. So it's really a completely different um, kind of thought process when you start asking questions. There aren't any yes, no questions in an on-farm readiness review. It's all, it's all very open-ended to try to learn more about your farm and your farming operation and then help you understand how food safety may or may not be impacted by those practices. Um, you know, gap audits are, are based on a checklist system and on-farm readiness review very much avoids that kind of checklist system. It's, it's way more um, designed to, to help you see where risk enters the system than a, than a gap certification would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I think one of the things that it is important to remind everyone is that uh, readiness audits, um, on-farm readiness audits are free Right, and it does then provide the opportunity 
to those farmers that you know use it to understand better what are some of the places where they maybe need to improve. Great. Um, so, <clears throat> and and speaking of you know the um, gap audits, um, one of the questions that we find that farmers often have are you know, as you, uh, all of you were sort of, you know, describing that there is a little bit of myths or, or fears uh, around, you know, what those gap audits uh, are. Uh, I think you've covered it, but I, I would like to maybe take an, an opportunity once again to sort of demystify what maybe, you know, fears that people have around gap audits. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, I mean, probably the, the biggest one for small farm is that it's impossible. There's just no way that you can do it. And we've just seen small and medium sized farms have a ton of success with gap audit programs across the country. So, you know, if you've got the smarts to run a farm, you've got the smarts to pass an audit. I mean, managing a small scale diversified vegetable farm takes so much emotional, intellectual knowledge um, that y'all are, are definitely capable. And there are so many great resources like Extension, like FOG to help. One of the common things that we, we hear um, all the time in the terms of gap audit, if you tie it into a regulatory inspection is, if I get a gap audit, do I still have to undergo a produce safety rule inspection? And the answer is yes. You know, uh, as was said earlier, the gap audit is a market access tool, right? It's a checklist and the produce safety rule inspection is a regulatory inspection. It's a regulatory, um, you know, requirement and um, it's not mandatory, you know, and it's important that the, the inspectors, be it state and or federal, you know, you know, you know, attest to the, you know, the farm's operation that they are in compliance with the requirements of the rule as outlined by um, Chris, you know, from the previous comments that was just made. So the takeaway here is that even if you have a gap audit and you're subject to the produce safety rule, you are still, you know, entitled to be in, um, inspected under the produce safety rule. And there are many others, but that's one of the key takeaways I will leave with you at this point. Yeah, and I'll say, let's be honest about food safety, right? The key to food safety is understanding and expanding what you know about food safety. Whenever anyone visits your farm, the fear is always that somebody is going to see something that you're doing that might be impacting food safety. So our natural tendency is to, to try to avoid people seeing something that we're uncomfortable with. Like, I don't want you to see this because you might see something I'm doing wrong. But the whole process of food safety is a continuum. Everyone who produces fresh produce is on that continuum of knowledge somewhere from poorer practices to better practices. And the only way we get better is by understanding what we're doing and how that's impacting the produce safety of those products we grow. So the more you know about food safety, the better off you will be as a farmer in terms of business security, the better off your customers will be in terms of, of produce safety. And you know, you wouldn't be in this produce growing business if you didn't care about the customers that were standing across the table from you at the market, right? Or or at the grocery store that you're supplying uh, wholesale to. So your whole goal is to produce healthy produce to get people to eat more produce. So understanding how your practices impact safety is the first step in understanding that healthy produce that you're growing. I think um, our natural tendency is to, to try to avoid things that we're afraid of. And, and I think the three of us are here really to tell you, don't be afraid of food safety learn more about food safety, understand food safety on your farm. We, we're we all in this uh, business because we wanna help farmers understand that and demystify that process. And I think really there's a lot of extension 
um, and regulatory people out there who are ready to help you understand that, um, you know, the nobody's goal is to stop you from farming. Everybody's goal is to produce healthy produce. And I think we all have that shared goal. I think we can all see that as as a common good. And and the more we can do to help you understand practices and how they impact safety, the better off everyone will be. You as a business person, um, the customers that you're selling to, the longevity of produce, fresh produce industry, every everybody benefits from knowing more. Absolutely. Um, here's a question that we get uh, from time to time, just sort of farmers asking it and curious about maybe um, examples of what are some of the, you know, common findings that occur during uh, on farm audits. That, that is a good, that is a good question. And uh, in, in one way, I want to kind of build off a little bit about what Chris just said, I mean, one of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic about produce safety is learning how much that when you implement these practices, it just improves your overall farm. Often there's this incredible connection between lowering your risks, increasing your shelf life. So, so this is kind of a soft answer and then I'll, I'll give a harder answer. But one of the common findings is that you're gonna find ways to improve your farm. Rarely are you gonna find out that something horrific is happening, but instead they're gonna really help you identify places to strengthen your operation. And there's just not a farmer I know who doesn't love improving their farm and getting better at farming. Um, and then maybe another softball answer for me and I'll let Trevor and Chris give the harder answers is, is the paperwork. I mean, oftentimes it's just not keeping the records the way that maybe the audit requires them, or you've just, you've missed a certain piece of documentation. Uh, sometimes it's an SOP that needs to be written down or a record that needs to be kept. And that's why it's so important to download that audit or to get something like the Produce Safety Alliance's required records document just to see where you're supposed to be. So as we say, no farm is a perfect environment, right? There's always going to be something that is going to be observed. Um, but what is important is you know understanding that you know the messaging that we have been given from the FDA's standpoint um, is we are educating as we regulate you know so when we come on the farms you know there is that imminent fear FDA regulators and so forth but I understand that we understand that but we continue to um, to assure you that hey you know we will work with you, you know, in collaboration with our state partners to educate you, to inform you, to show how the practices that observe, how it applies to the produce safety rule and what the requirements are in, you know, and sometimes it's just a matter of keeping tabs of it, taking the records, you know, putting policies in place, or you may already have them, but making sure those SOPs are being fulfilled by your employees on the farm and so forth of that nature. So it's that food safety culture that we would say, you know, have the habit of, you know, paying attention to everything. When something is observed, do something about it, right? When we do the on-farm review, you know, there are certain, um, you know, un unless we have an egregious conditions, you know, we will explain all that upfront, but in general, we will say, okay, here is an example of where risk factors you know you want to be uh, pay attention to you know help you how you assess risk factors that you know maybe that you may be aware of but not paying that critical attention to and then we have that again that whole system thinking approach to hear how this can connect to creating a problem if left ignored right so we're just trying to you know have that harmonized approach you know to the operation as we said we're not here to Tell you how to farm or to make your operation any more difficult, but we want to be a resource to you, and and hopefully we can you know bond in that sort of relationship, have those open communication, connect you with the resources in your states. You know, FOG, the Department of Agriculture have the extension people. We have industry folks who are doing education outreach, like Billy and others, and even us. So you know who the connected connectors are. You can reach out to and ask questions. You know, and and that's what this is all about. You know having that relationship where we can be having a comfort spot to work with each other. All right, so we're all friends here, right? I'm gonna tell you the, the truth 
about where challenge areas on small farms are, okay? So most of the time when we see challenges on small farms, it falls in the area of training for employees because you guys have oftentimes many volunteers that come and work for short periods of time on the farm. So your turnover rate for employees can be kind of high. Um, so how do you train those workers who are coming or volunteers that are coming? Or if you have a UPIC, how do people understand what your food safety expectations are for your UPIC, right? Those kind of things. Training is, is one of the key areas that people often have challenges with food safety audits or, or find during the OFRR process, they find this is a big area. Um, you know, harvest worker training, um or or um human hygiene training you know where do i wash my hands how do i wash my hands like we all think that's easy stuff but you've been to public restrooms just like the rest of us and you watch people use the restroom walk right out the door without washing their hands so um, understanding human nature and getting people to comply with what your expectations are for hand washing on the farm not that easy and that's a challenge area that a lot of small farms have the other place we often see um, difficulty with food safety on small farms is in the areas of cleaning and sanitizing surfaces so harvest buckets containers um, tables that people are sorting produce on um, how often do you clean it when do you clean it does it stay clean from the time you finish for the day until you start the next day? Um, do you have a process to clean it before you start sorting produce on it? You know, what's the what's your container and surface sanitation like? Um, and then the other thing is, how, how do I use all these sanitizers? You know, there there's a a million people trying to sell you sanitizers for for food safety on your farm. And so understanding when sanitizers are appropriate, how to use um, sanitizers for surfaces, for um, water, all of those kind of when we clean and how we clean and how we use properly sanitizers in the farming operation um, are often challenge points that we see for small farms, right? Those are the, I would say those are the biggest ones that I've seen um, going through both, uh, you know, gap auditing processes and, and OFRRs. And, and I want to take the opportunity uh, to uh, let those of you that have not yet um, had the chance to listen to some of our past podcast episodes that we do touch um, in, in the example that Dr. Gunter just gave us, um, the use of sanitizers and when it's appropriate and what the differences are in those things. So so um, I, I um, again, remind people that, that we do have some of this information. And uh, there's also uh, more uh, resources and other things that uh, farmers can take advantage of. One of the uh, questions that we got recently uh, was regarding food safety reports. Are there any recent food safety reports um, that farmers should know about or, or things that are coming out um, regarding food safety and, and, and practices and those sort of things? Yeah, thanks, JC. I, well, I'm gonna walk it back just a second because Trevor and Chris just cut, keep sharing so many good things. And I think maybe one of the biggest challenges, uh, certainly for me when I, when I was growing full time and, and really just in life in general, is a self-imposed challenge of just not reaching out and asking. Like Chris said, it, sanitizers can just become so complicated, even hand washing, just things that we take for granted. And just reminding yourself that you do have all these resources available and that brings you to the other challenge of time. It, it is a challenge to make the time to reach out to Extension, the Produce Safety Network, other service providers. But thankfully there's a lot of really great people who have been trying to untangle these riddles and these complications that we find on farms. So gosh, I know how busy it gets, but if you ever find yourself just pulling your hair out, um, just reminding yourself that there are just a lot of great 
resources already out there and folks like Trevor and Chris and JC who have spent a lot of time thinking about this and working alongside growers to find practical answers. So now I'll answer the question, are there any recent food safety reports that farmers should know about? I think it is just important to be aware of when outbreaks are happening. You know, I think we know like the seasonality of leafy greens, just so even when you're at the farmer's market, it might come up and just, just so being aware that they're happening, but also it's an opportunity for you to express, oh my gosh, you know, I, I did see that and it's so scary. And I just want you to know that on our farm, we do follow good agricultural practices specifically for that reason, like we're taking steps that we can to reduce our food safety risk. So uh, just a general awareness. And if you're really getting into food safety, there's a website called Food Safety News you can subscribe to. There's a pretty entertaining, truly entertaining food safety podcast called Risky or Not, where kind of everyday food safety questions come up or food safety talk. So there's ways to be plugged in, but just, just staying aware so that you can share the reasons that you're following good agricultural practices. Yes, Billy, that was really good, good um, account there. So I'll go to resources as well, similar to Billy, before I go to food safety reports that you should know about. Uh, and this is what the PSN is about. My work is about resources. I am a resource to you. The PSN is a resource to you. So. We work very, very closely with our State Department of Agriculture, with FOG, with many, many, many organizations to you know, conduct you know, training programs. They can be customized to your specific needs or to a particular commodity, whatever. And then we can also customize the training to a specific uh, subpart of the produce safety rule. An example, we have had workshops on Cyclosplora. Given the recent outbreaks, um, we have had that you know possibly linked to um, uh, water and so forth. So we also had workshop on biological soil amendments. We have recently completed a round of those trainings. You know, so farmers who are using biological soil amendments of ori animal origin, we can take a deeper dive. You know, you know, in terms of the best practices around you know using you know soil amendments and also how it ties into the produce safety rule. And what are some of the common questions that farms have around the use of such? You know, so we want to make sure that you know you stay in tune to you know your um, department of agriculture, to FOG, to your your um, publications that Billy um, just alluded to, and many others, because you know they will be a good point of um, of letting you know what activities we have. Matter of fact, I'm working right now. Uh, with some educational activities on the produce safety rule, looking at common questions that being asked on the, all the different subparts of the produce safety rule, and um, we're looking at the clean and sanitization uh, workshop series that you know, we we should be coming out with shortly as well. So we are looking to collaborate with Fog and others, you know, to be able to you know bring this to you and make sure it's meaningful and um, and hopefully you know it helps with your overall farm practices as we. We, we spoke of earlier. So in terms of um, food safety reports, yes, uh, FDA also publish um, you know, outcomes of reports when you know, the investigations are over, they will put on the FDA website, you know, the report and the details of it. Um, I would encourage you to you know, um, get used to the FDA link as well, you know, save it to your favorites or bookmark it, and, um, and you, you can subscribe to get those updates as well. One of the things that we do look for um, any food safety outbreak is uh, opportunities you know, to narrow that gap. You know, what improvements can be made? You know, what lessons can be learned from these? And what, you know, um, not just training on the um, produce safety rule, but what preventive measures you know, can we work on to you know, making sure you know, we minimize or prevent the recurrence of such outbreaks? You know? and, and that's where you, you will hear certain things like root cause analyses and um, prevention plans and more targeted training. You know, we want to make sure we address the needs that, you know, once identified that is causing these outbreaks. So again, you know, us working with you, better understanding your practices, and it takes some co cooperation and collaboration with the industry with you to be able to get to these points as well. So um, when we reach out to you, it's really because together, 
we really want to make sure we do all we can to protect your industry and also to protect the consumers, you know, because uh, public health as well. So hopefully um, that's, you know, is a positive takeaway out of all these. Chris, talk to you. Yeah, sure. I, I guess what I'll say is um, don't plug into so many reports that you get freaked out about food safety, because once you start looking at the recalls that are happening and and outbreaks that are happening, it's there. There are a lot of things in the industry, in the produce industry, that are happening that can be scary, especially if your market distribution is not wide, right? It's like, oh, this 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 huge outbreak in romaine lettuce is happening, and how does it impact me? Well, remember, you as part of the industry, you know, even though you're a small farm, um, and you're distributing um, locally your customers read the same news that you read. So when they see those things on TV, they start to wonder, is the produce that you're growing part of this outbreak? Is the produce that is in my backyard part of this problem? Um, as an extension person, I'll say, as a biased extension person, right? I will say that um, plugging into extension resources so that all of the information that you have is, is science-based. And when a customer asks you about a particular news story they saw regarding an outbreak, you can have an intelligent conversation with that person about how produce is actually um, getting contaminated and how you might be preventing it on your farm and always come back to the practices that you're doing that are designed to prevent contamination in the first place. I think that's reassuring to your customers to understand how food is produced and also that you as a farmer are doing everything you can do to make sure that that production is safe. I mean, these things are grown outside, con con contamination happens, right? So we, we know that, that um, risk can enter the system but our goal as producers is always to minimize the risk where we can and helping people understand that there are risks inherent in everything that we do. They drove to the market and they didn't think anything about driving and they're much more likely to get in a car accident than encounter some contaminated produce. But it's the difference between risks that people understand and think they are in control of and risks that they don't have any control over um, where the disconnect comes. And it's your job as a farmer to, to reassure those folks that if they have questions about safety, you you are plugged into the to the channels that have um, information based in science that's designed to help you improve your food safety on the farm. And I think that's really the key. Um, whenever you're talking about um, media coming in, you know, information coming in, reports about food safety coming in, they don't do you any good if you don't learn from those things that have happened and then improve the process. Um, Trevor mentioned, you know, the FDA always puts out a comprehensive report, a, a sort of an after action report on um, where they think a contamination event happened in produce and, and, and what happened during this process. Our job as farmers and as extension people is to learn from those outbreaks so that when they happen, we can use the information to make the process better, make our practices better. Lots of times we, we are learning along with everybody else about how these things happen and, and learning about the biology of the organisms that are, that are making people sick and then turning that information around to try to make farming operations better. And so I think as a producer, you, that's your job too. You're supposed to be learning from those reports what you can, learning from extension and other trusted sources, and then taking that information and doing something with it. You know, just reading a news report and getting upset doesn't help. Um, we've seen that in this many times in the pandemic, but, but doing something with the information that you read in order to keep people safe, that's always should be our goal. And I think that the uh, take home message today that uh, our panelists have mentioned several times already is the the key maybe to understand again these these things in your farm and expanding on you know your knowledge and understanding of what's happening as in terms of food safety and I think that that is extremely extremely useful to sort of keep in mind and remember and of course today's 
panelists. We again, thank them so much and appreciate they taking the time. These are very, very uh, useful resources themselves. And, and, and I would encourage people um, to, if they have an opportunity, to uh, interact with them in the future, uh, if possible. We will uh, then move on to Q&A, but be, uh, before we do that, we've been speaking about the resources and our panelists have already provided you with some of those resources. This is the uh, website to the uh, uh, Food Safety Modernization Act. So I encourage people to visit their, that website for information. Uh, on the food safety regulations. Um, here in Florida, we also have uh, the Southern Center, which is part of IFES in the University of Florida. Here is the website. They also have uh, extremely useful information um, that I encourage people to check out when you have time. Um, of course, Florida Organic Growers, our organization is constantly uh, through the podcast and you know, webinars like this one today, uh, try to inform you and provide you with guidance on food safety topics and really encourage you once again to check us out, uh, visit our, our website. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can send questions to um, our email address, info at foginfo.org. Um, with that, uh, we've uh, reach uh, the end of our webinar, but I did want to ask everybody uh, who registered and participated in today's webinar if you have any questions to write them in the chat so we can perhaps try to um, have those questions answered by our panelists. And I do want to, you know, again, can uh, thank Billy and Trevor and Dr. Gunter for uh, taking the time uh, out of their very busy schedule to be with us during this webinar and share um, all of the information and knowledge uh, that they've shared with us today. Um, I don't see uh, that we've gotten any questions, which either means that it, all the information was very useful and people are just so clear on everything that we discussed. Uh, and we really do appreciate everyone uh, taking the time to join us in this webinar. Um, please join us in our next webinar, visit our website for more information, and please don't forget to listen to our podcast. Um, thank you so much for uh, to everyone for um, joining us today. Thank you.